There's the email, so questions. Uh, we all, we, we're getting the, the part about uh, connectedness pounded into our brains here. Uh, whether you believe in Gaia theory or not, the point is, is that there's this connection, and I think what you're seeing today, and you'll see by the end of tomorrow, is that everything we do is connected. And I'm just going to reinforce that. Um, I always start with this model. Um, because I think that the model really explains everything. This is soil health driven by biology. These arrows are not placed randomly. The biology really unites the chemical and the physical properties of the soil. We talk about soil productivity. Most of the time we're talking about yield. And I heard yield this morning too. Well, what's my yield? What's this? Yeah, but is it any good for you? Is it just a whole bunch of calories? Or actually do we have good quality food? Does it mean something when I eat it? So, and what we want to do is make sure that all that, all those nutrients we put in are going into food quality. They're not leaching here, because what's the point of that? We're losing, we're losing our potential. We don't want to do that. And of course, the, the huge impact of all of this is on health, health of ourselves and health of our animals. And of course, I, I can't give a presentation without showing these beautiful scanning electron micrographs of mites, because that just wouldn't be possible. Uh, some of you in here do know me. Um, for 16 years, I was the rhizosphere ecologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, which is the equivalent of the ARS in Canada. Um, <coughs> then I moved with my husband onto his family ranch in the Bitterroot Valley of Montana, and, which is why I know about biomimicry. <laughs> and then um, I formed the company Rhizoterra, which you saw there, um, with my business partner, Fred Fleming, who is a farmer from Eastern Washington. And now we have an experimental farm in Eastern Washington just outside of Spokane. So sort of there's a, a lot going on there. So if you build it, we've all heard this. This is, um, this is David Brandt actually seeding his corn directly into his cover crop. Um, you build it as best you can. Um, when I'm working in Africa, we, we do whatever we can. And this works just fine too. Um, and of course, when you do it, they come and they come in droves. This is 40 years of no-till. This is a handful of soil from the Lethbridge Research Center. Um, it was 40 years in no-till with not even a diverse rotation on it. Just wheat, 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 and more wheat, and more cereals, and away we go. Um, but the point is here is that the disturbance is the first part of all of this. It's about creating the habitat. And then the habitat gets really interesting when you can start to look at it up close and in person. Now we start to see tardigrades or water bears, really cool little animals. Um, and then, of course, we have earthworms. And earthworms, if we think about the soil food web, the earthworms are sort of on the perimeter of the web. You have to have, as, as Chris Nichols said, you have to have everything happening before we start to see the earthworms come. So when you start to see the earthworms, and again, we can put a shovel or a spade in the ground, flip it over, look, we're looking for anything above five earthworms in that spadeful, and we're calling it good. And the more, the merrier. And then if you're really lucky, you start seeing these little guys. These are cocoons. So actually, in this photo, we actually disturb these two earthworms having sex. Because see these orange bands on here? They're very sexy, and these are the results of it right there. And they were very busy. There's three cocoons there with anywhere between three to five individuals in each one. What's important here is the quality of organic matter. So earthworms, every different earthworm species has a weight that it has to make to become an adult. And when it makes that weight, it gets to have this orange band. So you can see that the quality of the organic matter is really important because when, if they can make the weight faster, then they can reproduce more over the very short time that they have in the ground when the conditions are right. So it's all about quality of the food, not in so much quantity. But it will take time. This is a soil in Australia. Look at this movement here of the earthworms. Look at the structure of that soil. That is going to sit there as long as that. You uh, actually, in the middle of the drought three years ago in Victoria, Australia, in the province of the uh, state of Victoria in Australia, you could see Robert Rule's farm from Google Earth. It was the only one that was green in the entire state. He's a long-time no-tiller, but look at that soil structure. 
takes time. So I'm going to, and, and Ray talked about your ecosystem services. Well, this is what this is about. The more quality soil organic matter, the better off we are, because what we're really trying to do is make our, we're going to trying to get more and efficient soil ecosystem <laughs> services. And the services, the number of services are endless. And I'm not going to talk about that today, because we could go on and on. Um, I thought this was important about habitat, because ultimately, plants drive. Rhizosphere processes drive all of this. The biology, Chris made a really good point this morning about how all that soil carbon really drives the microbiology. And we're going to talk more about this. But the key thing about soil structure is like, look at this. You've got this plant, it can't go any farther. So it depletes its resources really quickly. It sucked all the water out of there that it can get access to. It sucked all the nutrients out of it. And then hopefully there's a few mycorrhizae around to help it a little bit farther. But once we start to have better structured soil, there's no problem there. It's going to grow faster. It's going to grow easier. It's going to have more nutrients available to it. It's going to have more water available. We're going to have more biology. We're going to have more organic matter. And then, lo and behold, because it's all connected, we're going to have more soil structure. It all goes around. And when we start to have more soil structure, we start to have soil that looks like this, as opposed to what's looking like that. And that poor really puny root trying to get through there. Soil structure, a habitat. There are all sorts of organisms in the soil, the bacteria and the fungi, and these protozoa that are and nematodes that cannot burrow. They can't make their space, so they have to rely on soil structure to move around. And we have all this microbiology, all these bacteria and the fungi, and it really doesn't matter what we do to soil, we'll always have bacteria. I mean, we've polluted soil so terribly, and still, by remediation, we can make them work with the bacteria. There are some soils that 2,4-D doesn't even work in anymore because the bacteria eat it. As soon as, they, as, soon as it hits the ground, the bacteria de demolish it. It's an energy source. Okay, we've used it too often, but yeah. Um, but the point here is, is that these guys are nitrogen concentrators. So what happens here is that these guys go around eating up all the bacteria, and they eat up all the fungi, and then they poop it all up into a nice little pile that is full of nitrogen. There's your organic nitrogen. And now the bacteria come back at that, and they recycle it again, and we start the whole cycle again. Predator-prey relationships are driven by soil structure. So we get some good, soil, better soil structure. We get more predator-prey relationships. We get more nitrogen cycling. So those are the chemical properties. And then we come back around again, and we build better soil structure. Deep roots. This is a developing soil profile. This is out of Wisconsin. And you can see old root channels in here. We got a little help from some deep burrowing earthworms in there as well. <coughs> Make it easy for the roots to move deep. Let's get them deep. The, flaw, the deeper we go, we can attract that subsoil nutrients. Ah, oh, but then what's even cooler about deep roots? We start to actually get, I'm going to go back here. We start to get, with the deep roots, we start to actually get hydraulic conductivity. So now, those deep roots are actually tapping into a different reserve, so we're not tapped out, different reserve, and they're sucking it up. And as they suck it up, they leak things out. And now we're feeding the other plants because everything is all entwined. I always put a slide in that's from another country because oftentimes if we do it ourselves, everybody goes, yeah, that's good. But has anybody else done it? OK, well, here they have. This is in German. So um, this is plowing. This is mulching. And you can see we still do enough to soil disturbance that we still have a similar looking three species. And kind of a similar profile. Then we get to direct seed. Oh, now we've added three more, two more species there. And now look at pasture. This is about diversity. So now you build it, they come. You add a pasture, you add a forage. We start to see more soilers, we start to see better soil structure. It all works together. We've seen enough of this. I'm not going to go into that. This is our Monet cover crop. I put this in because if you build it, the, the pollinators and the beneficial insects come as well. Um, this is, so now, we, not only do we get roots, we build organic matter, we get better soil structure, we get above ground beneficial insects as well. 
Think of what potato producers and things like that can do. That We have a potato producer in Bozeman, Montana, outside of Bozeman, Montana, that uses flowers between, uh, actually every so often within his fields, as well as the perimeter, to try and control aphids. Roots touching one another. Look at that. See how some of these are really bright yellow? This is a really interesting phenomenon. Mycorrhizal fungi, so our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, they actually, in, with certain plant species, make a yellow color, a bright yellow color. And that would be most, actually, warm season grasses. So you'll actually, and it's canary yellow, you can't miss it. But it's water soluble, so you have to be very quick. So you sort of dunk them and look. Um, it's an another nice thing is onions. Onions roots will become very, very yellow when they're infected with mycorrhizal fungi. So it's another one that you can actually bait your soil and see them for yourself. There they are there. Uh, this is a weed. This is knapweed, for those of you who know anything about range. Knapweed is highly mycorrhizal. And, you know, and, and yet many of our domesticated plants or our crop plants are not. Barb Hetrick, who was with um, Kansas State University a long time ago in the early 70s, wrote a beautiful paper that showed our land races of plants are highly mycorrhizal, but our crops that we develop from them are not. And part of that's because we have used luxurious amounts of fertilizer in order to actually get our seed and d develop our genetics. And so what we need to do is actually look at that very seriously in how we breed plants and actually breed for root systems. Sunflowers, they get down there. That's why I love to put sunflowers in mixes. Not only do you get pollinators, but you get deep roots, you get better soil structure, they're highly mycorrhizal. Um, you can mix them with your turnips and your radishes that aren't very mycorrhizal and still hold the mycorrhizal fungi in the ground, so you still get better soil structure, but you get all the benefits of the soil animals. So I'm going to tell you right now that having radishes in your mix or any kind of brassica is Red Bull for soil animals. They go nuts on it. Earthworms, they love it. So that's, why, so that's why the mixes are so important. I don't care if you put two or three in. I don't care if you put seven or eight in. It's whatever you can tolerate and whatever you are good at. But the point is, is make it a mix. It's your one opportunity to build diversity into our cropping system. If you can feed it, all the better. Uh, Martin Enns from the University of Manitoba, who does a lot of work on organics, did a very nice economic study last year that showed that you get $169 profit from grazing your cover crops. And that was an economic study. It's very nice. Soil food web. So now I'm going to just go into carbon just a little bit, because I think that the one thing we've heard a lot of talk about, Chris talked about a lot, was carbon. Well, what is all this carbon? What is photosynthesis? I think when people think about carbon, they don't necessarily think about amino acids and nucleic acids and organic <coughs> acids, but those are all carbons. Phenols, they're on a carbon chain. So let's think about the carbon backbone. Because that carbon actually carries a lot of nitrogen. It carries phosphorus. Sometimes it carries micronutrients. Sometimes it carries trace elements. It carries a lot of really good stuff. And that's what we're feeding. So we look at the root exudates. This was done by um, Dr. Pate. Dr. John Pate from Australia in 1976. And you know, Ray talks about how old some of this stuff is. Well, mining some of the old stuff is a really good idea sometimes. But what I'm showing you here, this is what leaks out into the rhizosphere in terms of nitrogen from these different plants. So this explains the biodiversity. This explains why I want to put beans and peas in there. Look, I get four colors instead of just two or three. I get more complicated nitrogen carbon compounds. That's what I want. I don't want simple stuff like nitrates. That's already done. I want the amides. And part of that is, is that what is the biggest problem? We saw today. We see runoff into Chesapeake Bay. We see the problem with the Gulf. We see things streaming into the Great Lakes. If we put the nitrogen, if we put our nutrients into an organic form, they don't leach. We hold on to them, and then we build soils, and then we can use them when we need them. That's what we're after. 52% of the organic, the biomass. So it's growing over 52% of the microbial biomass is growing from root exudates. That area of the rhizosphere is the most biologically active part of your entire soil. 
Don't check between the row. Make sure that you're always looking in the row. Because you're looking at these guys. This is the cover crop. We, I, I call this my Vogue mite because it's been on the cover of a lot of things and you've all seen it in Farm Journal a lot. But look at the chompers on this thing. It's eating organic matter, it's eating other mites, it's eating other organisms, it's chewing things up and it's pooping them out into beautiful pellets that are creating better soil structure, which are then attacked by the microbes, which are freeing up the nutrients again. We're all connected. We think about what's on the top. Yes, we need to hold on to the soil so it doesn't blow away. Yes, we need to do that. Yes, we do need to keep it covered and we need to grow a lot of roots. The roots are more important. The top stuff, that's like the icing on the cake. So let's talk about the rhizosphere. The root, the soil that is attached to the root, and the soil that is influenced by the root. Because the soil leaks. Every different plant that you put in the ground, every different one, leaks its own signature of amino acids, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, phenols, nasty things, good things. It's a signature. Because if you're stuck in the ground and you can't move, what do you do? You can't run away from stuff. You defend yourself. You attract beneficials to you. Mostly what plants try and do is to modify their habitat so it's really good for them. They send out chemicals that attract all the really good bugs around them so that they can benefit from them. And they send out nasty signals to tell you not to bother grazing it because you'll make you sick. I mean, they're actually sending a whole slew of signals. And Dr. Jack Schultz, um, TED Talk is really worth listening to about what signals that plants send. So let's talk about the rhizosphere effect. Here we are. Rhizobium, um, mycorrhizae. Rhizodeposition is a fancy word for root exudates. You can see nutrients coming in. Nutrients get leaked out through the rhizodeposition. Water goes in, water goes out. Disease-causing organisms are sending nasty substances to slow the root down. But so are other plants. Weeds sent a lot of negative single signals out to stop other plants. Growth-promoting substances, a lot of the bacteria that are plant growth-promoting are sending out auxins and GAs and other things in order to actually make more roots because they want more habitat. So it's a big chemical signaling going on down there. There's lots of good stuff going on down below. All these different roots. This is one of my favorites. This is faba beans. You can see that we have quite a good root growth, but look at the roots on that. Very nice. But it's all about roots. It's all about soil temperature, too. That 20 degrees Celsius, which is somewhere around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, is the perfect temperature. And you can see that when you get on either side, oops, yeah, either side, um, not bad, a bit on the slower, lower side, especially for cool season plants. Um, but the other thing about that is that your mycorrhizae are also working at high speed at that same time. That is the optimum speed for cool season plants. That's what they like. And, uh, and your whole neural network, all the pipelines are working at high speed when that happens. And when we increase the carbon, when we have mycorrhizal colonization, mycorrhizae actually modify the plant's biochemistry. They make plants photosynthesize more. They make the plant put more amino acids, organic acids, down into the roots. That means they leak more things out. That means they get more plant-promoting rhizobacteria. It's very selfish. It's doing that because it needs the host, and it needs to reproduce. So it's making the host really strong so that it can also reproduce. And when it does all that, it means that there's more enzyme activity going on with the microbiology, too. So you can see, the whole thing just gets better and better and better. They're leaking all of these things. There's car carboxylates to get phosphorus, iron, um, because actually um, a lot of microorganisms need a lot of iron. They use it, and um, fluorescent pseudomonas in particular. And when they're using it, uh, if they don't get enough iron, then they start producing hydrogen cyanide gas which roots don't really like very much and the other organisms around them don't like very much, but they're really gassing their neighbor in order to get the, the iron from their neighbor. I mean, that's what they're actually trying to do. So we're going to try and take advantage with the rhizosphere of all these things going on in here. And, you know, we can just pick and choose our plants, mix them together and sort of 
oh, I think I'll control this and I think I'll do this. And I think the future is really about instead of variable rate fertilizing, it's about variable rate seeding and variable species seeding over your field to, to actually deal with your problems. Look at this. Maize roots, they start being grazed on and they start attracting other things to the rhizosphere in order to take care of their problem because they can't move away from it. So they just send out a signal. It goes out on the wire, out on the internet. Hey, you know, get over here, nematode. I need you to take care of this insect problem I have. Lupins, when they get stuck into a, 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 a particular situation where nutrients are depleted, they'll actually form cluster roots, which only last for about two or three days. And then they actually take bursts of acid out there, bust up the compaction, but also release all the phosphorus so they, and calcium so they can take it out. Yeah, plants can do all this. I wanted to explain, too, some of the differences between what goes on. We hear about increasers and decreasers in range. This is a beautiful little paper done by John Neal, who's now at West Virginia. And, and I think about it, some of um, Ag Canada's really great free-thinking scientists have gone to West Virginia. Unfortunately, um, one of my very good friends, his wife was killed at West Virginia by an assassin and I'll just call it a terrorist. And um, so that one actually came very close. Um, but here we have the native grasses, which are actually trying to share. They're actually sharing. Whereas the cheatgrass is trying to make sure that it gets everything. It's going on a power trip. And the native grass is sharing. That's about mycorrhizas, and that's how our ecosystems work. So, we're, if we develop, if we look to nature, then we were about sharing. These, we started playing in the er, early 90s, we started playing with mixed covers in Lethbridge, Alberta, which is an 8 to 10 inch rainfall zone. And this is what we grew, some of the things we grew. Um, we were doing that and we were growing legumes in there because we understood this even then, that it was really the legumes not just the diversity, but the legumes that drive the whole system. And somebody asked that question today of the panel. The one thing that I think we got wrong, we needed to make the transition. When we get healthy soils, we need to show that we're also producing high quality food. And I think this is, we need to make this a goal. So here we, is what our ha, -ha moment. I'm not going to dwell on all the low input is no-till, and we were doing no-till organics in the, in the 90s. But what happened here with this blue here is we added an annual forage in there. We said, okay, let's really up the diversity. And let's put an annual forage in. Everybody says, well, we don't want to do a perennial forage because we just can't do that. But we can do an annual one. Look what happened here. Look at this number. Look at these numbers. They all started to go up. And we went, oh my gosh, the only thing that we've done differently here is we put an annual forage into the rotation. And now all of a sudden we have high quality food. We were making in here the proteins in this year, um, in these rotations here were, you know, in the organic we were always making 14%, but not so much in the low input. And part of that was because we didn't have a legume always in the system. It's all about legumes, it's all about mixed forages. And that actually is old. I'm moving now, transitioning from soil health. I've talked about what drives soil health. So how do we make our food better? Well, one of the things, and this is why you'll see in a lot of my research, I use ammonium sulfate. I'm interested in B vitamins. I want to keep the nitrogen in an organic form. I don't want it to leach. I'm trying to hold on to it. So here is what we put together, and we put all these in the field at once, and we put them in two locations, one that had 22 inches of moisture, and then we grew wheat after it. Um, and during the year that we had them, we were interested in this. Uh, these aren't in order. I'm not sure why that happened, but never mind. Um, this is the dry matter yield of that cover crop, and this is in the low rainfall area. And you can see that some of the mixes didn't do very well, but they were, you know, for every every kilo or every pound of yield, I had a pound of nitrogen. This number nine, and we're going to look at that one just a little bit more. Let's go back and see what that guy is. 
subterranean clover, sorghum, sudan, and buckwheat. So you can see what we're trying to do is get the a narrowness of this relationship so that we got enough dry matter yield, but it was nitrogen rich. And then look what happened. Edmonton is where we have a lot more rainfall. But you can see the phosphorus. Look at the differences. We were pulling things up into an organic form. We were pulling, and so some of these plants were way better at things than others. Some of them were good at nitrogen, some of them were super good at phosphorus, some of them were good at calcium, some of them were really good at iron. So then we started looking at these mixtures. And then we looked at the yield, and then we looked at what was inside those plants, in the grain. And then we looked at, we really liked peas, hairy vetch, and oats. Not only did we get a reasonable yield, but we were really high in micronutrients. And zinc was one of the ones we were keying in on, because that affects cognitive ability. So our ability to think, and that's really important for our kids. Faba beans, peas, oats, highest except for iron. They didn't do very well on iron for whatever reason. Um, and, uh, then, and then this was really interesting here. Lentils and phacelia just blew the iron concentration right out. So if we wanted to put iron into the subsequent wheat, especially in areas where we have problems with you know, iron deficiencies and anemia, well, let's think about phacelia and some of those things. Um, just some of, this is sorghum sudan grass, and this is buckwheat. Um, just there, and, and this is oilseed radish. Chicory, um, I, unless you are perennial grazing, do never, ever, ever. I'm just warning you, and don't grow chicory. Just don't do it. Um, if we're in a perennial system, no problem. But if you are actually cropping, do not put chicory into your system, because you will never get rid of it. And selecting. Genetics are important, too. I want this one. That's what I want. I want this particular variety. I, that one's not bad. This one sucks. But I want that one. I think that legumes, it comes back to legumes again. I think that's just what it comes back to. I want to see this in the United States. I want to see this. I want to see people eating bread that's healthy for them. I want them to tout it. I'm the scientific advisor for Shepherd's Grain, and we put nutrient density on the back of our flour because it's important to us. I want people to be enjoying good food on health from healthy soils. And I know that we can do this. I know we can. With no-till, with cover crops, with our cropping practices, integrated livestock. And for any, I don't know if people in this room have ever worked in Africa, but we need integrated livestock. It's absolutely critical. It is a measure of a man's status and his wealth in his community. And it is folly for us to take that away from them, or even to think about taking it away. We need to find ways of integrating livestock back into the ecosystem. So with that, I thank you all very much, and I'll pass it on to Rick Haney. Thank you.